Some of the most pressing issues in today's world are poverty and inequality. While a small group of billionaires live in astonishing abundance and opulence, with houses and servants and yachts and diamonds and wealth that most of us can't even imagine, around 700 million people live in extreme poverty, defined by the World Bank as living on less than $1.90 a day. And a shocking 1.8 billion people, roughly a quarter of the world's population, live on less than $3.20 a day. And fully half of the world's population, some 3.3 billion people, live on less than $5.50 a day. Let that sink in for a moment. Half of the world's population live on less than $5.50 a day. In our rich and abundant world, how is that possible? And how is it possible that, as Oxfam recently reported, just 26 of the world's richest individuals own more than this 50% of humanity combined? What have we done? How have we organised our global society to make this reality possible? And most importantly, what do we want to do about it? So while there are many different causes of both poverty and inequality, one of the most important causes, which people often ignore, is the fundamental structure of the world system. And most critically, that the economy is largely global, while democratic systems of regulation and taxation are only located at the national level. This makes it virtually impossible to regulate the global economy and make it work for the benefit of everyone. There are two basic problems. Firstly, the scale mismatch between global economy and national regulation and taxation creates all sorts of loopholes which allow elites and big corporations to escape regulation and avoid paying taxes anywhere. And secondly, the lack of democratic structures at the global level to make decisions regarding global economic matters means that there is no means for the world's people or their representatives to come together to decide on democratic terms to change the system and then to create enforcement mechanisms for the new rules. Let me give some examples to make this clearer. Let's take a look at the tax system. This is an obvious thing to look at because taxation and redistribution has been the main tool by which most governments seek to reduce inequality and balance out their societies. As inequality has been rising so sharply, particularly since around 1980, we might wonder what happened to this system? Well, most national tax systems were developed between around 1930 and 1960. This was a time when most economic and business activity happened within national borders, and rates of international or cross-border business activity was very low. So the systems were designed to focus almost entirely on taxing income and profits created within a country. And then the government of that country used that tax money on public services in that country, and on redistribution between the rich and the poor, again, within that country. However, in the 1980s, economic globalisation got going, and governments decided to allow capital to flow in and out of their countries much more easily. The financial markets began to integrate more closely, and businesses started expanding their operations and their marketing to include other countries. But the tax systems didn't really change. As corporations found that they could pick and choose which country to operate in, they often started to choose countries which had lower rates of corporate taxation. Why wouldn't they? So suddenly countries found themselves all competing against each other to attract corporations to their countries, each one lowering the corporate tax rate more than the last one. So it's not surprising that from 1980 to 2010, corporate tax rates fell dramatically in almost all countries, from around 40%, to roughly 25%. So what this means is that over this period, governments got less tax money from corporations, and thus they had less money to invest in society and to redistribute to the poor. Instead, the corporations got to keep more of their profits for themselves and for their wealthy shareholders. And so this obviously was a major contributor to increasing inequality. But there's more. As corporations expanded and started operating in many different countries, they found that in the international system, where regulation takes place only at the national level, there wasn't a legal structure which they could use to set themselves up as a, as a global corporation. 
Instead, in each country that they worked in, their operations had to be established as a separate legal company in that country and according to that country's rules and regulations. So instead of becoming global corporations, they became transnational corporations, networks of related but separate companies operating in different countries. So Shell, for example, or Unilever or any other big corporation that you might think of is legally actually not one big corporation. It's a network of Shell Netherlands, Shell UK, Shell Nigeria, and so on. Each one is legally its own separate company. But of course, this is a bit of a myth, because the corporations are in fact run as one global corporation, following the strategy and direction of the headquarters. But it's a very useful myth. Useful for the corporations, that is. Because it provides them with a way to legally avoid paying a lot of tax. Here's how it works. Imagine a transnational corporation. Let's call it Stone. Stone has headquarters in France and two subsidiaries, the mining company, Stone Nigeria, and the consulting company, Stone Luxembourg. If Stone Nigeria buys advisory services from Stone Luxembourg, the executives in the Stone headquarters in France can decide how much they should pay. And since this money will never actually leave the whole sort of stone corporation, they can choose to set the cost far higher than the actual market cost. And in this way, they can covertly move money from Nigeria to Luxembourg without anyone knowing. Why would they want to do this? Well, one reason to do this would be to avoid paying taxes by shifting their profits. If Nigeria had a corporate tax rate of, say, 30%, and Luxembourg had a corporate tax rate of, let's say, 5%, that would be a good reason. And if they could set up a third subsidiary in the Cayman Islands or in some other tax haven where the tax rate was zero, and then they could find a way to move all of the profits over to that company, well, that would be even better. They'd have to pay no tax. You get the picture. This practice is so common, it's even got its own name, transfer mispricing, and it happens a lot. To get an idea of just how much, let's recall that today there are around 100,000 transnational corporations, and between them they carry out about two-thirds of total world trade. And around half of the international trade that they carry out is actually trade between two different subsidiaries of the same corporation. So that's around a third of the total world trade. And while not all of this intrafirm trade is carried out in order to move money from A to B so as to avoid paying tax on it, an awful lot of it is. It's been estimated that around $138 billion of potential tax payments is lost this way every single year. That's a lot of money. A lot of money that should have been public money, that states could have used to build schools, provide healthcare, support the poor, but instead it's become private money, forming the increased profits of a small group of the already wealthy elite. The unbalanced international system, with the global economy, but with regulation and taxation at the national level, creates all kinds of other similar loopholes through which the elites and the transnational corporations can find ways to legally avoid paying taxes. If there was a democratically elected layer of government at the global level, then all these loopholes could be closed, and this could all be sorted out. First of all, it would make it possible to treat transnational corporations as what they really are – global corporations. They could be legally registered as one business entity, and then regulated and taxed as such. Secondly, it would be possible to create a common rate of corporate tax for the whole world. So then there would be no benefit in shifting money from A to B, because it would all be taxed at the same rate anyway. And moreover, it would be the end of tax havens, who would no longer be able to have a zero rate of corporate tax. And if we did all this, it would be possible to tax global corporations as the one entity that they actually are. Setting things up in a sensible way, with the regulation and taxation taking place on the same scale as the business operations, would solve so many problems of tax avoidance, and thus force the elite and the corporations to pay their fair share of tax just like everyone else. And with more tax money, states could invest more in society, making it better for everyone.
And if some of this tax money were collected at the global level, say through a global tax body, then the democratically elected global layer of government could also decide what to do with that money. Perhaps it would go to the government of the state where the tax money arose. Perhaps it would be redistributed to a poorer state, more in need. Or perhaps it would be used to pay for efforts to solve common global problems, such as climate change, for instance. Most likely it would be a combination of all of these, and the result would be a reduction in poverty and inequality, both in countries and between countries, and also the creation of a fund to finance the provision of global public goods. You've got to admit, it sounds pretty good. It could get even better. Everything that I've said up to now was about closing the loopholes and making the current system work. But what if we took it a step further? If we have a global tax body and a democratically elected global layer of government, then we could decide to implement some new global taxes with the aims of reducing inequality, curbing harmful behaviours and providing global public goods all at the same time. Now, there are in fact several proposals in this regard. French economist Thomas Piketty, who has carried out some of the most detailed studies of economic inequality to date, has suggested a global wealth tax in order to bring down today's shocking rate of inequality. According to his calculations, a tax of just 1% on all wealth could raise $1.56 trillion. A really huge amount of money. And that if that was transferred to the so-called developing countries, it would totally end poverty and completely change the world. Or if we only wanted the tax to kick in for the very rich, he also suggested an alternative model of a tax of 2% on wealth above 4 million euros. So if you own less than 4 million euros, then you wouldn't have to pay any of this tax at all. Designing it this way would raise 500 billion euros. Still a very large sum of money that could significantly reduce inequality and do a lot of good in the world. Another suggestion is a global financial transaction tax. This is based on the ideas of James Tobin from the 1970s, who wanted to put a small tax on currency trading. Ideas have developed since then, and the current idea is to put a small tax on traded shares and bonds of just 0.1%, and on derivatives of 0.01%. This tiny tax would raise money from the financial sector, where most of the super wealthy hold their money, and is also a sector which is particularly undertaxed and indeed oversubsidized. Having such a tax would slow down speculative trading, which would be a good thing in its own right. And it would also raise a lot of money, probably around $300 billion per year, predominantly coming from the wealthy, that could then be redistributed to the poor, or again, invested in global public goods, such as the fight against climate change. Yet another idea is a global tax on natural resources. This could both de-incentivize the unnecessary use of finite natural resources, and at the same time raise money for redistribution, and again for global public goods. One idea is to have a small tax, just 1%, that companies would have to pay when they extracted natural resources, such as oil and gas and minerals. It's been estimated that a 1% tax on oil alone would raise $300 billion a year. And there are many other possibilities. But the point is this, we have the tools to deal with economic inequality. They are taxation and redistribution. The contemporary international political system, combined with the global economic system, has led to a situation where our national level systems of taxation and redistribution don't work effectively. And this is one of the main reasons the inequality has soared. If we could build a democratic, global level of taxation, we could both fix our national systems and get them to work again, and also develop a whole new global level of taxation and redistribution. Doing this is the best way that I can think of to reduce economic inequality and create a more balanced and fair world. But hang on, you say. Don't we deal with poverty and inequality through international development? What about the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals and all the aid that governments give and all the NGOs doing development work to help the poor in Africa and Asia and Latin America? Isn't that more important? Well, let's take a look. First of all, the results speak louder than any arguments that I can bring. Despite all these efforts, there is still the shocking poverty and inequality that I've described. 
So all this development stuff doesn't really seem to be working. Secondly, let's look at how much money is actually given to the developing countries in government aid. It's about $134 billion per year and trending downwards. Do you remember how much money is lost each year due to transnational corporations using clever schemes to avoid paying taxes where they can? It's about $138 billion per year. And an awful lot of that is due to developing countries. So if we could just stop these clever tax avoidance schemes, that would be pretty much just as effective as giving all of this aid. And as it is, the two pretty much cancel each other out. And if we look at how much money is needed to fully implement the Sustainable Development Goals, the sum that is estimated is $1.4 trillion per year, a figure way above the amount of development aid currently given. So how does anyone actually plan to implement the SDGs then? Well, they don't really, is the honest answer. There are vague hopes that private sector investment will fill the gap, but the private sector invests in order to make a profit, not to help society. And so this doesn't really make sense. And in any case, even if it did, there is no sign of them stepping in with anywhere near this sum of money. But remember Piketty's wealth tax? Just a 1% tax on global wealth would raise $1.56 trillion per year. Bingo. Done. But perhaps the biggest flaw with the SDGs is that it puts the responsibility for poverty alleviation with each government. Each country has its own goal and is supposed to work out how to get there on its own. So the SDGs are fundamentally international and not global. Instead of looking at the world system as a whole, seeing how it fosters poverty and inequality, and then trying to change that system to something more just and democratic, the SDG framework focuses the attention on each individual country, as if it existed in a vacuum, and then looks at what can be done in that country and only in that country to alleviate poverty and inequality. And while of course there were always small changes that can be done inside a country, this framework completely distracts people and NGOs and development organisations from the core global problems that are the main drivers of poverty and inequality. A few years ago, I attended the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development at the United Nations in New York. This is the annual meeting where governments are supposed to report on their progress to date on reaching their targets for the SDGs. And it was the most bizarre and pointless meeting that I have ever attended. Imagine all these state representatives in their suits and ties, taking around five minutes to present what they had done. They'd built some hospitals, they drafted a new environment policy, they created a retraining scheme for the unemployed, and, and so on and so on and so on. All things that governments do anyhow for the benefit of their population. Then people got to ask one or two questions, and everyone collapsed politely, and then on to the next country. And this went on for a whole week. And then everyone went home. Nothing, absolutely nothing was discussed about the world order and fundamental global issues, such as tax, but also sovereign debt, international trade rules, and various other features of the world system that make things phenomenally hard for developing countries. Sadly, the notion of development, rather like the notion of human rights, has just become a smokescreen to make it look like we're doing something about poverty and inequality and injustice, when actually we're not. The international politics of social justice has sadly become a theatre, a farce, a fake. If we really want to bring about global justice, if we want human rights, if we want to reduce inequality and create a fairer world, then we need a layer of democratically elected government at the global level and a set of global institutions, like a global tax body and a human rights court and various others, which will enable the people of the world to make human rights and economic justice a reality. There really isn't any other way.